Welcome back. Um, we've just looked at um, digital communication generalities in the previous segment, and now we're going to apply that. We're still talking generalities, but looking at more towards the actual types of hardware, the things that you would find in real life. Now, we are not going to look at any particular microprocessor. We're not going to look at the specifics of a particular device. We're still talking about general things, but we're looking at from the perspective of what you would find in any range of microprocessor or in any system. Uh, and in particular, we'll look at um, generic types of um, universal synchronous or asynchronous receiver transmitters, and then these two standard SPI and I2C. So the USART, um, the acronym is spelt out at the top here, it's, it's a block, it's a unit that you would find inside a system on chip processor or microcontroller that would handle the communications from two devices. Just general communications. Um, I'm talking about device A and device B here, and typically we'd wire them up with either two wires or three wires, sometimes more, to allow us to do asynchronous or fully synchronous communications. I'm showing the case here where full duplex is used. Of course, you could only just wire a single of these lines up if you wanted to just do um, simplex communication or even if you wanted to do half duplex. But this is the, the general case anyway. Um, if we look at the, the top diagram here, this is a, a UART, it's asynchronous. Asynchronous means there's no clock line. Um, it's symmetrical. A and B are both wired up in the same way. Obviously the thing that transmits from A crosses over is receiving in, in D. Uh, sorry, in B. And the C and D at the bottom, um, we've got the same twisted set of data pins, but we have a clock. And there's only one clock. And the clock is coming out of one device and it's going into another device. And I've said that the, the device that outputs the clock in the general case is the master. It's the thing that controls the communication. And the simplest reason for that is that if, say, the master decided not to output a clock, then D can't communicate. So we'll get this terminology master and slave um, over the next few slides. It's quite common. So a, a UART, that's without the S, not a USART, a UART, is a asynchronous receiver transmitter. A little diagram on the top right shows that it's asynchronous. And what it's doing inside, at the transmitting pin, it's doing a parallel to serial conversion. And we'll see in a moment at the receiving pin, it's going to be doing a serial to parallel conversion. I mean, it's just like an ADC and a DAC. There's some sort of conversion here. Internally, we know that our microprocessor contains a control bus, an address bus, and a data bus. And they will be addressing and talking to one particular unit inside a microcontroller. And that unit would be the UART or USART unit. Typically, the data bus um, puts data into some sort of buffer, FIFO, first in, first out. And it puts data into the buffer, which is then transmitted bit by bit, bit by bit, clocked out with an internal bit clock. Okay, there's no clock. Um, being sent from A to B, so that the clock which is doing the transmitting is only internal to device A. And we have these D flip-flops down the bottom here, and the D flip-flops are taking the bits that the data bus has written into the buffer, and they're taking each one of those bits through a bit of logic into D, and then they're being clocked out of Q. Okay. That is the TXD pin. When we look at what's coming out of the TXD pin, it will be D0, D1, D2, D3. Then the next word is brought in. 
and we will do the new D0, D1, D2, D3. Then the next word is brought in and we'll do the next D0, D1, D2 and D3 and so on. This is the kind of logic that is being implemented. At the receiving side, we've got our same control bus, address bus and data bus, and we've got a FIFO buffer, but this time the FIFO buffer is being read. What comes in on the RxD pin is being clocked by the same type of internal bit clock. It's not the same clock because this is a different device. The transmitter is one device, the receiver is a different device. But its internal bit clock should agree with the transmitter as we've seen in the, the uh, first part of this segment. So the data on the RxD pin is being clocked in through here and the first bit, second bit, third bit, fourth bit, once they've all four bits are in, then they'll be pushed up into the FIFO buffer, they'll be D0, I'm sorry, D0, D1, D2, and D3 respectively, and they'll go into that FIFO buffer, and they'll be read by the data bus. I mean, to be fair, the actual implementation details are more complicated than this because there's some signals inside that says when that buffer's full and so on. But this is the, the basic logic of what's happening. Something is being clocked out of a parallel buffer to a serial pin at the transmitter, and a serial pin at the receiver is being clocked in to a parallel buffer, which is then read inside the CPU. Now that's the general thing. Let's look at the specifics of these two protocols I've mentioned, SPI first, Serial Peripheral Interconnect. There are lots of synchronous serial standards. And this is, along with A2C, is probably the most common. SPI implements duplex communications, and there's one wire for each direction. So we can see in the diagram here, so there's one wire for transmit, and simultaneously there's one wire for receive from the perspective of the master. And, and we'll see in a moment that we don't use this terminology TXD and RXD because it's, uh, it's confusing. Um, what's TX for the master is RX for the slave. We need different ways of naming it. SPI is really useful for short range communications inside a device. Uh, you'll probably find quite a lot of it inside a standard mobile phone or inside a computer. Uh, one thing that SPI is used for is um, uh, storing memory items into little tiny flash memory devices. Uh, an example would be storing the MAC address of a device. So every network interface has got a MAC address and that's stored in a little flash memory device. Usually they're wired up to a microprocessor through SPI. SPI is a master-slave protocol. So one of the devices is designated a master, that's usually the CPU, and the other devices, it's usually the peripherals, are the slaves. And you can connect as many slaves as you want. Because SPI is synchronous, there is, of course, a clock signal that's necessary. Right. And there's also something here which is a chip select, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now, the way you'd wire it up is, is shown like this. This is actually taken from a circuit diagram, so it's, it's just cut and pasted here. And um, I'll talk to you as promised about the terminology in a moment um, but first of all you should note that there's the single master which is probably a CPU and that there's these multiple slaves the N slaves here there's some shared buses so the three shared connections that go to all of these devices are at the top here and then there's three separate pins here, one for each device. So that first line goes only to slave station one, the second line goes only to slave station two, the third line goes only to sta slave station n, three in this case. 
So those three wires are one per slave. And those are the select wires, chip select or slave select. The common wires, the three that I said at the top here that are common, they are the serial clock, MOSI, which stands for Master Out Slave In. That's the output data from the, from the master. It goes to all the slaves. And MISO, which is Master In, Slave Out. That's the output from slaves going into the master. Now, obviously, only one slave can output on the MISO signal at any one time. And that's the function of the CS, the chip select or slave select pins. And the way it works is shown down the bottom. So if the master wants to read from or write to device 1, what it will do is it will select CS1, it will select device 1, and it will say, hey, device 1, I'm about to talk to you. It will then output a command on MOSI, Master Out Slave In. And because device 1 has been told that it's been selected, then device 1 will listen to that command. Device 1 would then respond. And it can do that safely on the MISO wire because we know it's the only device that's selected at the moment. All the other devices will remain quiescent or sleeping. So this is the basic principle of SPI. It's a very nice protocol. Inside, what's happening inside the chip, the master device and the slave device, it actually looks pretty similar to what we saw for the UART. We've got a data bus in the master. We're not really drawing the address bus and control bus here. But there's a data bus which is putting data uh, into a shift register. A clock generator is then clocking out what comes out of that shift register on the MOSI pin. That's going to the slave, whichever slave happens to be selected. And the same clock signal is, of course, going to the slave because it's a synchronous protocol. Okay. That then clocks in the MOSI data into the slave. Once it's clocked in, the slave can then read it. At the appropriate time, based on the protocol, the slave will then write something into the SPI shift register. The master will start up the clock again, and that data will be shifted out on the MISO pin to go into the master's SPI shift register. When that's been clocked in enough, the master will read it into the data bus. Right. So there's a shift register at both ends which holds the data going out and coming in. And there's a clock which starts at the master and it goes to all the slave devices. And there's a, a control block which in the master which selects whichever slave is being talked to at that time. Like many different protocols, there's some configurability here, so the, the clock polarity and the phase can be configured. So um, MSR, sorry, SPI in, in one particular hardware device might be a little different to SPI in a different hardware device. The programmers may have configured them differently. What's important is that within one system, all of the devices connected agree on how it works. I've taken this image um, copied directly from the SparkFun website. I love this image. Um, that's why I've copied it. It'd be too much for me to redraw it. It's just so nice to understand what's happening. It's taking the, the um, four wires that are involved in SPI when you've got a single slave and a single master, and it's just looking at what's happening on those pins. Black means something is being driven, and grey, as in just here, uh, at the end and down by the clock and so on, this, this means that the system is idle. It's slightly different terminology here. We use CS for the select, 
here they use SS, but it's the same signal. So in operation like we've seen, the master sets the SS pin, the chip select, low. That means from this point on that this connected slave is selected. The master then starts to output a clock, just here. And on the falling edges of that clock, it outputs data on the MOSI pin. So this data changes to coincide with the falling edge of the SCK pin. The slave should read what's on MO MOSI on the rising edge of the clock pins. And the slave would read 11001010. One, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero in this case. After a little length of time, the slave has received this thing, the slave needs to respond. So the master again starts its clock. The master starts the clock again. And this clock, this eight toggles on the clock, this time the slave outputs something for the master to read. And the slave is outputting things coincide with the falling edge of the SCK and the master reads the rising edge. So in this protocol the output changes on the falling edge and it's read on the rising edge. And the master would read one sorry zero one one zero 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 one zero from the slave. There may be more things happening but eventually the master will stop talking to the slave and it will therefore make, make the um, chip select signal go high again. And that's the basic communication mechanism. Another part of the protocol, which we're not going to talk about here, is what the master is sending and what the slave is sending. We will look at that a little bit for I2C in a moment, but let's just look at the I2C method of communicating, a uh, method of wiring up, which is quite different from SPI. Let's look at the similarities. It's synchronous, it's pretty slow, it's generally used for internal devices, it's uh, good for short-range communications. So I2C is called Inter-Integrated Circuit. It was developed initially by Philips for use inside their televisions is to communicate between different devices. And you might find that if you have something with a remote control, that the remote control inside the television is communicating using this type of protocol. It's synchronous, um, but unlike SPI, there's only two wires. And that's a shared data wire and a shared clock wire, or serial data and serial clock. All devices connect to all wires, and these wires are also pulled up to VCC. That means that if no device is driving the bus, the wires float to a high voltage. So high voltage means idle, and when things are driving this bus, they drive them down to zero. We'll see that in a moment. Just like SPI, multiple devices can connect. But in this case, you can do one master like an SPI, or you could have multiple masters. So there's a way in I2C for any device to become the master. We'll see it in a moment. Uh, the other difference with this and SPI is that if you remember SPI has got the MOSI and the MISO pin. It's got one pin for outputting from the master, one pin for inputting to the master. Uh, therefore, it could potentially communicate in duplex transmission. Uh, in this case, there's only one wire for data transfer, and that wire has to be shared in terms of direction. So the master outputs, the slave inputs the same wire. So it's half duplex.
Let's just have a look at uh, slightly more detail about the protocol itself. Uh, I'll run through a few examples um, with some, uh, some diagrams here. So to start communicating, remember, when nobody's communicating, that the wires are pulled up to VCC, so they float high. So we're showing SDA and SCL just here. They're floating high. Nobody's using, nobody's using the bus. So if a device wants to communicate, it, maybe it needs to send uh, some data from itself to somewhere else. And first of all, it checks the bus is free. So if the bus is floating high, we know that it's idle, the bus is free. If that happens, it signals to everybody else on the bus that it wants to be the master. And this we'll see on the next page is the so-called start condition. So the device that signals a start condition becomes the master and it starts to output a clock, the SCL, which is shown here. And this SCL is toggling, in this case, nine times. Then it starts to output data on the SDA pin. Now, the SDA pin um, in the I2C protocol is slightly different to SPI in that the data that's output changes when the SCL is low. So SCL is low here. The SDA pin starts to change and output to high. Then SDA, sorry, SCL is high, and then the bit on the SDA pin is stable. So every time SCL is high, the bit on the SDA pin is stable. So devices in I2C, they read the data pin when the SCL is high. And if they're writing, if they're outputting, they do that when SCL is low. What is output? is first of all an address, and the address is output most significant bit first. So this is address bits A6, A5, A4, A3, A2, A1, A0, seven bit address, and that's output on the SDA pin, just as highlighted here, okay? And the purpose of that is the master is outputting an address. All the slaves are listening to the line and all the slaves have got their own address and they're all waiting to see, hey, is that addressed to me or is that addressed to someone else? So as we mo uh, mentioned on the previous page, there's a special start condition and a stop condition. The start condition is that um, a device that wants to be master checks if the bus is free. If the bus is free, then it drives SDA from high to low, so it drives SDA low, there, while SCL is still high. Okay, That signals to all other devices that that device wants to be the master. And the stop condition is very similar. That master device, it drives SDA from low to high, and SCL is high. Remember, I said to you that the data pin, the data only changes when SCL is low, right? When SCL is low, is the only time when the data changes. So the start and stop condition, they break that. They change SDA while the clock is high. And that's why devices which are connected to the bus know that this is a special condition. So that device that wants to be master checks the bus, the bus is free, it drives SDA low and it says I'm the master and it will remain the master until it releases with a stop condition and no other device can be master of that bus in between the start and the stop. Every other device is a slave in that time period. Okay. As I mentioned, once the master device has grabbed hold of the bus, it outputs an address. It outputs the most significant bit first, and the slave device will read 
or all the slave devices, in fact, will read this address on the rising edge, uh, on the high edge of SCL. And the address ends where I indicate just here. That's the end of the address. Okay. So after that, there's an RW bit and an ACK bit. Let's look at those. So the RW bit is the master saying, hey, I want you, slave, to read, or I want you, slave, to write. Okay, that means I'm a master, I'm sending something to you, slave, or I'm a master, I'm getting something from you, slave. So if RW is low, if this bit just here happens to be low, then the master will then output data in the next few cycles. The master will output the data, the slave will read it. But if the RW bit is high, just here, then in the next few cycles, the master will stop what it's doing and it will wait for the slave to output data. Okay. The ACK bit, which is the next thing, is the slave acknowledging to the master. So the master actually leaves a gap at this point, and it's waiting for the slave to acknowledge. And the slave will acknowledge by pulling down the SDA pin for one clock cycle. Which slave? Well, it's the slave that's just been addressed. So maybe the master has output an address um, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. Then the slave that has that address, it will receive that address and say, oh, that's for me. And the slave will then acknowledge at the appropriate point, which is just here. The slave will pull the SDA line, the shared SDA line low. So this diagram shows what the master is outputting and it shows where the slave is outputting something, which is just here. Okay? So, the master has grabbed control of the bus. It's output an address, most significant bit to least significant bit. It then outputs one bit to indicate whether it's going to be writing to that or reading from it. And then the slave that's identified by that address gets a chance to acknowledge, hey, I'm ready. If the slave doesn't acknowledge, then the master knows that there's been an error. Maybe it's addressed the wrong slave, or the slave is dead, or the slave is sleeping, or something. The master will then take appropriate action, whatever you as a programmer have asked the master to do, in an error condition. Now, Sometimes the slave is pretty slow. This happens a lot with today's microprocessors being extremely fast and some peripherals being pretty slow by comparison. So if that happens, if the slave is slow, the slave can tell the master, wait, 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 just wait for me, wait for me. And the slave can do that at almost any time and it does it by driving SCL low. Hey, remember, the slave's not supposed to write to SCL the slave's supposed to write only to SDA and only when it's told to. So this is a condition that's unusual. So whenever the master detects, hey, somebody's pulled SDA low, the master responds saying, whoa, that means that I'm going too fast. I better just wait for a while. And the master will wait until that slave stops pulling SCL low and then the master will continue. And it's a pretty neat way of the slave saying, wait, wait, hold on, you're too fast. Now this seems like it's, uh, it's quite complicated, um, but both of these protocols are actually really well thought out, um, very commonly adopted. They're nice protocols. And you'll find that when you buy a microprocessor, you buy something off the shelf from Texas Instruments or some other uh, manufacturer, you probably have I2C or I2C controllers and SBI controllers built in. 
if you want to use these protocols and your micro has a device like that built in, you are very fortunate. So your software is like this. Let's say you want to use SPI. Well, you write the software to configure the SPI unit. Once it's configured, you just write in your software, you write to that unit. You write to its transmit register. It transmits to something. And then something might, trans might send some information back. And your code inside that master, it reads from the SPI receive register. Uh, maybe you use interrupts. Well, actually, you should use interrupts. So your program configures interrupts. It writes to the SPI. When that device, that peripheral, decides to reply to the microprocessor, then the SPI unit flags an interrupt to your microprocessor. And you have an interrupt service routine that goes and reads the SPI unit. Sometimes you have to have an external device. You can buy little tiny chips that do nothing but implement I2C or SPI. And you, you can have that in your circuit next to your microcontroller. And your microcontroller connects to that chip using a parallel bus. Again, you connect your CPU, you configure that unit, and you read and write. And maybe that unit can interrupt your CPU. All of the protocols, all of the error handling, all of the toggling the acknowledgement bit and the RW bit, so all that's handled by the unit itself. On the other hand, if you don't have such units and you don't really want to have a separate chip, you can just use a couple of GPIO pins. For SPI, you might just need four GPIO pins. One pin is an output, that's MOSI. One pin is an input, it's MISO. Another pin is an output, that will be the SCLK. And one more pin is an output, which will be the chip select. And that's the four pins. And then you need to write a piece of program, a piece of software, that's going to toggle these pins in the right way based on the timing diagrams that I'd shown in the previous pages. And then you need to make sure that you toggle them in the right way. And then if the slave doesn't respond, you do the right thing. So you have to read the standard, read the protocol and understand it to code this up. Well, these days you can probably just download a code handling library, download an SPI handling library, and you just tell that library which pins you're using and it will take care of the protocol for you. But in the old days, certainly when I started my career, we would do it all manually. We'd write our own programs to do this. And it, it's fun. So we just covered um, in this second part, USART and UART, Universal Synchronous Asynchronous Receiver Transmit. It does everything. It's a block inside a microprocessor that you can configure for communicating. Uh, the UART, which is more traditional, is asynchronous communications. Uh, the UART, an example, um, would be something that implements an RS-232 connection. And then we looked at two more modern things, synchronous communication protocols, SPI and I2C. And we looked a little bit about the protocols there because there's some interest. Um, and you can see that it's pretty logical. And it's just a matter of reading the standards, reading the protocols, getting your head around what's happening. Uh, but once you do that, then they're, they're very easy to follow and easy to understand. And, and like I said, I think they're quite fun to try to debug.